Hello, and welcome to In the Privy Council, a podcast reviewing cases heard before the Judicial Committee of His Majesty's Most Honorable Privy Council, brought to you by the Legal Style Blog. I am your host, Elijah Granite. This week, we are discussing the Jamaican case of Finzi and Jamaican Redevelopment Foundation Incorporated, the citation for which is 2023 UKPC 29, Jam. This case concerns the criteria on which a court will reopen a previous judgment when, possibly years later, a party raises new allegations about fraud. It arises out of a dispute over a loan the appellant, Mr. Winston Finzi, and his companies received in the 1990s. His debts were eventually purchased by the respondent, Jamaica Redevelopment Foundation, which sued him to recover the debts. The details don't matter much here, but suffice it to say that in 2004, JRF sued Mr. Finzi, who lost after offering a rather weak defense. The same happened in 2005. Eventually, in 2012, the parties agreed to a settlement. Then, years later, Mr. Finzi comes along with a raft of new allegations, including some very lurid claims about fraud, and pleads to reopen the case. JRF applied for summary judgment, and in the High Court, my lord, Mr. Justice Lang, granted it, on the basis that for an abuse of process claim alleging fraud to overturn res judicata, it must first bring fresh evidence not available at the time of settlement or judgment. Furthermore, this new evidence must be evidence which could not have been discovered by, quote, reasonable diligence before the settlement and judgment. Those two words, reasonable diligence, reflect a standard Mr. Justice Lang derived from an English case, Tahar and Gracefield Developments Limited, 2018, Chancery, page 1, Court of Appeal. And here, I want to note that although Mr. Justice Lang's decision turned on the reasonable diligence standard, the board, as we'll see in a moment, would later hold that no actual new evidence was raised. So it's really on both grounds Mr. Finzi, and I'm going to spoil it here, fails. This should have been it for Mr. Finzi, but after the Court of Appeal refused him permission to appeal in 2020, the United Kingdom Supreme Court overturned Tahar. See 2020 Appeal Cases, page 450, Supreme Court which had provided this diligence standard. So, after the Court of Appeal refused, Mr. Finzi appealed that to His Majesty in Council, after which the board gave permission for the appeal to be heard, which is where we pick up the case. For the board, my lord, Lord Leggett, began by reviewing the abuse of process rule, which prevents this kind of relitigation. Its narrowest form is rather old, going back to Roman law, and hence, of course, the Latin phrase res judicata. This is expanded in common law by the rules around abusive process, perhaps stated most definitively in the classic case of Henderson and Henderson, 1843-67, volume of English Reports, page 313, Court of Chancery. That case established a general principle that in the public interest that litigation comes to an end, parties to the case should bring up any arguments they have at trial, and not only after judgment, since holding on to arguments just so you can try the case again is a misuse of process of the court that prolongs litigation against public policy. Then, his lordship turned to the accepted basic principles of why a judgment might be set aside for fraud, namely that the dishonesty must be both conscious and deliberate and material to the case. It is the application of these principles in Dakar that had created the problem here. As I mentioned earlier, the Court of Appeal in Dakar added in this reasonable due diligence requirement. The Supreme Court in the same case disagreed in uh, Tahar at the Supreme Court, my lord, the Lord Kerr of Tanakh Mor, held that this requirement was not supported in precedent, and as a matter of public policy, it was absurd to let fraudsters benefit when their victims, 
by bad luck or stupidity or anything else, weren't diligent in discovering the fraud. There was also another judgment in the Supreme Court in that case from my lord, Lord Sumption, who, in an obiter dictum, offered an alternate test, one which excluded as abusive process those fraud claims only where the claimant was aware of the fraudulent evidence at the time of trial and chose not to raise it in the proceedings. This is quite a radically different test to the reasonable diligence standard or the controlling test of the traditional standard of fresh evidence material to the case in uh, Lord Kerr's judgment. Now, when this was applied, that is to say, when the dictum of Lord Sumption was applied to Finzi's weak arguments, it was readily apparent that he hadn't actually brought forward any new evidence. Yet, Mr. Finzi's counsel argued, and, and this is where things get interesting, that he still was not abusing the court's process, because even if he had the evidence and did not make use of it, Lord Sumption's dictum meant that it was sufficient that a reasonable person should not have advanced the evidence due to some compelling reason. Here, Mr. Finzi relied on a court of appeal case applying that dictum of Lord Sumption's, uh, Park and CNH Capital, 2022, one weekly law reports, page 860, Court of Appeal, which endorsed uh, this dictum, which took it up. Yet, Lord Leggett emphasized that this dictum, like all of common law reasoning, must be read in context and in light of the ratio of the judgments, and the same goes for its application in Park. The job of the lawyer is not merely to analyze the language of the judges like some sort of oracular wisdom or extra book of the Bible, but to actually understand the law and the legal principles driving that language. Thus, when we actually look at Tahar in context, on the facts, it didn't actually involve questions over the freshness of evidence. Instead, the only question was if there was an obligation to discover that fresh evidence with reasonable diligence. Hence, when handing down his dictum, Lord Sumption was not contemplating its use, or rather, misuse, in cases like this, where the claimant was relying only on evidence available to him at the time of the original judgment, where there was no fresh evidence, as indeed is the case with Mr. Finzi. It cannot, therefore, that is to say, Lord Sumption's dictum cannot, therefore, constitute authority for this point. Further, in analyzing Lord Sumption's reasoning, Lord Leggett identified that Lord Sumption was basing it off the well-known principle that perpetrators of fraud or deceit cannot rely on the foolishness of their victim. This is, as Lord Leggett observed, an orthodox point in misrepresentation in the law of contract. But as applied to claims of fraud, in light of the Henderson and Henderson principle, it ignores the public policy considerations here. In Lord Leggett's view, Lord Sumption omitted to consider the weight to be given to the need for finality in litigation. The court's powers of abuse of process are an expression of this overwhelmingly strong public policy goal, and hence the breadth of those powers, and making an exception for fraud to the Henderson and Henderson principle would undermine this paramount policy goal that litigation comes to an end. Lord Leggett's analysis was bolstered by the fact that there has been an upswing in vexatious fraud claims which are designed to have an excuse to force courts to reopen closed judgments or to void settlement agreements at the behest of a sore loser who held on to some evidence of fraud or, in fact, who has no evidence whatsoever and is making a purely vexatious claim. If a claimant chooses not to rely on fraud at trial, it raises the possibility, thus, of tactically deciding not to bring up fraud in order to have an excuse to undermine a potentially unfavorable judgment. Thus, in cases like the case at Bar of Mr. Finzi, the claimant had the obligation to prove to the court that there was a good reason he had not relied on the evidence, which in practice will mean only showing why the claimant was impeded or preventing from raising that evidence. Absent that, the default is to assume abusive. 
The court, in evaluating this standard, can take account of the conspicuous strength or weakness of the claim, if applicable, but only as one factor weighing on the justice of allowing or not allowing the evidence. And, and to emphasize that, the point of that rule of considering the case as one factor is so that if the case of fraud is exceptionally weak, that can weigh towards not admitting it. But by considering it as one factor, Lord Leggett emphasized that this is not to become a mini-trial. This is not to turn every fraud claim into an excuse to reopen everything else. Thus, it is only one factor. It is not a summary judgment standard application. So now if we apply all this to the case of Barr, Mr. Finsey was involved in a very long, multi-year litigation, which there was no known reason why he or his uh, apparently quite competent legal representatives didn't allege fraud. And in fact, he advanced a case inconsistent with the particulars of his new allegations of fraud, to which there was no evident substance. Lord Leggett concluded by pointing to the well-worn dicta cited in Tahar that fraud is a thing apart and unravels all. That might be true in some contexts, but to quote his lordship, allegations of fraud are not to be regarded as some kind of open sesame, which have only to be uttered to enable a party to engage in a new round of litigation. Mr. Finzi had every opportunity to fight the fraud case, and he didn't. And then he shows up later and goes fraud, expecting it to work in that memorable uh, imagery of Lord Leggett as open sesame. Well, that is not acceptable. And thus, the board humbly advised His Majesty to dismiss Mr. Finzi's appeal. Turning now to our discussion of the case, there are three points which stand out in this appeal. The first is about the abuse of process jurisdiction and the reasons behind it. The powers of the court to regulate its own business under its inherent jurisdiction are considerable, precisely because of the strength of that public interest in the Henderson and Henderson principle. The finality of court judgments and the legal certainty this provides are crucial to the good order of a system of dispute resolution. If Lord Sumption's test had been applied, it would essentially allow a gaping hole in this regime. By accepting from the Henderson principle that court parties should raise issues at trial, not later, a huge category of claims. While well, the reasonable diligence standard in Tahar was an error, it is equally an error to try to rewrite Henderson to accommodate people who fail to raise allegations of fraud despite having the evidence and opportunity to do so. Second, this case is a study in how we are to read judgments. As Lord Leggett noted, judgment reading is not an exercise in deriving the oracular wisdom in the words of the judge, but rather of setting the dicta and ratio in their proper context so that the underlying legal rules can be elucidated. Simply trying to treat Lord Sumption's musings, and Lord Sumption on the bench was very fond of musing on things in his judgments, as universal authority ignores that the dictum was made with a particular case and facts in mind, and the facts of that case were quite different to those in Vinzi. Finally, this case illustrates one of the delights of the common law, that weak, hopeless, even borderline, if not over the line, vexatious cases can still make good law. This was never a case where Mr. Finzi had any chance. His arguments were at every stage risible, and yet this case was able to contribute to the common law across the Privy Council jurisdictions, and quite persuasively, I would say, in England and Wales, by expositing legal principles that underlied the, frankly, uh, very, very weak arguments being put forward. And that's a beautiful thing about the common law, and we should treasure it. Long may weak, hopeless cases contribute to the improvement of the legal system. Thank you very much for listening to another episode of In the Privy Council, brought to you by the Legal Style Blog. I've been your host, Elijah Granit. If you want more legal content, visit our website, legalstyle.co.uk, or follow us on Twitter, at Legal Style Blog. If you have any comments, suggestions, rants, or raves, the email of the podcast is editor at legalstyle.co.uk. We also welcome any ratings or reviews on your usual podcast platforms. 
Until next time, goodbye, and God save the king.